and we are live. Thank you. Good afternoon colleagues and welcome to the Liverpool City Region Audit and Governance Committee. I'd like to welcome all those present. The meeting will be broadcast live to the combined authority website and available for subsequent viewing. Can members and officers please ensure that when you wish to speak you indicate in the chat box. When you are invited to speak please unmute your microphone and switch on the camera. Don't forget to turn off your microphone and your camera afterwards. Can everybody also please ensure their phone is on silent. Um, apologies for the delay for the start of the meeting. But there's been a change to the membership of the committee since the last meeting. So I'd like to welcome Councillor Jeanette Williamson and once again thank Councillor Pat Hackett for his uh, contributions during his time on this committee. Um, are there any apologies for absence? Thank you, Chair. We've had apologies from Councillors Baines, Williamson, Mayor and Watson, and we've had a technical issue with Councillor Morgan as well. Thank you. Are there any declarations of interest? I haven't, I haven't received any for this meeting, Chair. Would anyone like to declare any interest? No. No. The minutes of the previous meeting of the audit um, committee held on the 4th of November are included at pages one to six. Can I ask monitoring officer Jill Cool to provide the committee with an update on the working group that was established to uh, work on the process of dealing with complaints at the September meeting. Mrs. Cool. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm pleased to report that we've had two uh, discussions with members and we've had two meetings with the monitoring officers of the Merseyside, um, Merseyside Heads of Legal Group. Um, there's been an event that's occurred since the task group was set up in September, and that event is that the Local Government Association has published in December a new code for members and members' code of conduct. So we've taken the opportunity amongst the officers to review whether we should look at two issues rather than one issue. And the two issues would be to see whether we can adopt a consistent member code of conduct for all of the Merseyside City Region Combined Authority members and to see whether we can also adopt a same or similar process to deal with those complaints. Further work is being undertaken amongst the officers to achieve both of those things and a report will be brought back in due course to members for their consideration. We hope to keep the task group informed of the most recent meeting, which is due to take place at the end of, not next week, the week after, the end of January. Um, and we hope to be able to provide an update to the working group members as to where we are before our next meeting on the 3rd of March. Thank you. Um, at the last meeting, uh, the committee also requested a written response regarding the bike loan audit recommendation. Um, can I ask Laura Williams to provide an update on that work, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, and firstly, apologies for uh, not circulating this in writing. This is a brief update um, and this is a, a positive one. So members will remember that the issue uh, was that when we had uh, undertaken this piece of work, we found that one of the recommendations agreed at the previous audit um, had been found uh, not to have been implemented. And this quite rightly gave members of the committee some concern. Um, we have since uh, engaged with the learning team and the problem that they found uh, in implementing the original recommendation was a practical one, which is now being resolved. Um, so I'm pleased to report that we do have a constructive way forward in respect of that recommendation and we will be following that up uh, in the, the weeks and months ahead to ensure that, that those uh, measures have been put in place. And obviously that will filter through the internal audit update report for your information. Thank you, Laura. Um, with those matters addressed, can I ask that, that the minutes of the last meeting are agreed, please? I'll take silence as, as, as acquiescence then. Happy, happy to agree those minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cameron. All right. Um, agenda item four, internal audit update. Can I invite Laura Williams, head of internal update? Head of internal audit to give us the update. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. So this is the uh, routine internal audit update report that comes to each one of these uh, meetings for members' information. A few key points that I would like to draw to your attention. 
Um, first of all, uh, in respect of the timing of this piece of work, it was rather unfortunate um, in that we were required to produce it before the Christmas break, um, obviously so that the agenda would be ready in, in plenty of time for you. Um, this has meant that um, we were a little bit earlier than we normally would be in terms of reporting on our performance for the quarter. Um, but we did complete four pieces of work in the period um, up to Christmas. Um, and we have a lot more work uh, in, in, in progress uh, and, and progressing towards being finalised. So, um, so the, the, the stats are better than they uh, would appear um, on the report that is in front of you. Uh, so four pieces of work completed in the period and, and those set out for you um, at section 2.1 of the report. Uh, then the remainder of the report goes on to set out for you um, findings and significant um, audits undertaken of corporate systems, that's in section three of the report, and particularly of note, um, it was the recommendations made in respect of the insurance claims audit, uh, which was given an overall opinion of moderate, and there were some issues of concern uh, that were drawn out there. And members will be able to uh, to note those recommendations. Um, I think what is important uh, to say there is that uh, since the, the agenda was published, we have had um, dates agreed for the implementation of those three recommendations that are set out for you uh, in Table 2. Um, and the implementation of those recommendations is underway, so it has been a very positive response to that report, which is very pleasing to see. Um, the report also goes on to set out for you the uh, findings from um, other pieces of work that we have conducted uh, in respect of um, combined authority specific systems and also for your information, uh, Mersey Travel specific systems, just uh, in order to give uh, the, the committee transparency and members will note a significant piece of work and a moderate opinion um, in respect of the audit of operator of last resort. And again, there's a lot of work in progress uh, to address that recommendation and a very positive uh, outcome from that audit. So again, that is pleasing uh, to see. Uh, members will also note um, at section six that we have set out uh, our key performance indicators um, and as I stated earlier, uh, we are at a, a position of 70% uh, target of the uh, internal audit plan completed by this stage of the year um, and we when the report was written, we were at 40%, which is to say is disappointing, but does belie uh, the progress that has been made since. Um, and we are at more like 62% uh, when we take into account um, completed and, and commenced audits that are um, approaching completion. So the figures are healthier than they appear, um, and we are still on target to deliver the plan by the end of the year. Um, the other uh, performance indicators are also positive. Uh, members uh, will note. And the final um, element just to, to pick up for you at section six um, is a, an issue really arising from the, the, the pandemic and some of the issues that heads of internal audit are facing um, in, in respect of being able to provide the annual opinion. So members will know that on an annual basis I present to the committee uh, an annual report and opinion and my ability to do that is obviously incumbent or dependent on my ability to complete the plan of work. Um, and um, what we're starting to see is some heads of internal audit feeling uh, that there is some uh, question about whether they will be able to provide a full opinion um, because they have been unable or prevented from completing their plans uh, because of the, the strain um, that, that the pandemic has placed on their organisations. And there are a variety of very legitimate explanations for some of that. Um, I wanted to, to reflect on this um, to you and reassure you that at this stage in the year I'm not expecting to be in a, pin, in a position where my opinion for the year will be limited. We've made excellent progress in terms of completing the plan and as I stated earlier we are hoping to complete the plan in full so um, barring there be, being any disasters or any unforeseen circumstances um, I will be hoping to be able to provide you with a full opinion um, later well later in the, in the year actually in the, the new financial year uh, and be able to present that to you but it's worth drawing that to your attention at this stage um, but it is um, of credit to my team but also to the, the wider organisation that we don't find ourselves um, in that uh, position. So I'm very happy to take any questions on, on that report. Thank you Laura. Um, any questions, members? 
Councillor Cameron has indicated she'd like to ask a question. Thank you, um, Shauna. Councillor Cameron, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, I understand all of the exceptional circumstances at the moment and probably the training that we've got arranged in February may help me in understanding some of these. But I just had one question on the appendix where you list um, the audit plan for this financial year. So and naturally, I scroll down and look at anything that's a major organisational risk. But I just wanted to understand the bus alternative delivery models. It was indicated as major, but the status is withdrawn. Does the status mean uh, postponed to a different year or completed or no need to complete? And what does withdrawn mean in this context? Thank you, Councillor Cameron, for the question. Yes, this is covered actually in the in the um, the bulk of the report um, as one of those audits that is questionable in terms of whether it will go forward. And it's simply a function of of where the project finds itself. So, um, so yes, it is. Um, and, and was identified at the start of the year as a significant um, risk to the organisation because of, of where things were at that time. Um, since then, obviously, the, the impact of COVID on, on bus patronage particularly um, has, has put the organisation in a, a, a position where um, that project is, is being looked at again and being reconsidered. And so from an audit perspective, the timing simply isn't right for us to do the piece of work that we have planned to do. Um, so we have simply deferred that for consideration again um, as part of the planning process for 2021-22. Um, and we'll look at that again and we'll pick it up. Um, However, we, we remain involved in that project. I have reviewed a number of documents recently, um, so it isn't that it's out of sight. It is simply that um, the piece of work that we uh, had in our sites um, is, is not appropriate to do at this time, but it's, it's still very much on the agenda. Um, but I think in terms of, of the risks that it presents now, um, comparing that to the risks that it presented when we constructed the plan at the start of the year um, has changed significantly. And so I think that's the appropriate response at this stage. Um, but it, it, it hasn't slipped, it isn't forgotten about. Um, and we will pick it up a, a again for next year's internal audit plan. Does that answer your question, uh, Councillor Cameron? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Deferred, um, deferred makes more sense to me. Thank you. Yes, yeah, OK, thank you. Um, I had a similar question, but it's been picked up in, in your answer to uh, Councillor Cameron's. Um, so can we move on then? Oh, sorry, any other questions? No. Can we move on then to uh, the next agenda item, which is the counter fraud update? And again, it's you, Laura. <laughs> Thank sorry, you. Chair, can we just move the recommendations of that last report? Uh, right, sorry, yes, uh, completely. Yeah, I forgot to do that. So can we agree the recommendations as set out on page seven? <clears throat> they agreed or are we? Yeah, OK, I'll take silence. Yeah. Thank you. So now we move on to agenda item five, uh, counter fraud update. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is the uh, routine annual report that I bring uh, to the committee um, to really bring together all of the, the details in terms of the plans and activity in place for managing the risk of fraud and corruption in the organisation. Um, so, so this sort of brings everything together into a single report for you, but I do cover this um, in each of the internal audit updates that, that, uh, that we just considered. Um, obviously didn't uh, duplicate that detail in, in this report uh, this time. Uh, so a number of areas just to, to pick out for you, if I may. Um, so first of all, one, one of the significant things that we do on an annual basis is to undertake a self-assessment against the SIPFAR code of practice on managing the fraud of risk of fraud and corruption in local governments. Um, and this is really very much about establishing the culture um, and principles of um, being able to, to manage the risk of fraud within the organisation. So part of that is obviously internal audit's responsibility to help and inform and support the organisation to do that, but it is a wider organisational responsibility. Um, it's pleasing to note that we still have high level um, of compliance um, with the requirements. So that is sitting at around 84%. Um, this is an annual self-assessment, which uh, members may remember uh, I presented to you last year. 
Um, and in table one, I've set out for you there a set of actions that I think uh, will be beneficial for um, the internal audit team, particularly to take forward um, in terms of strengthening um, some of those areas and, and, and going a little bit further in terms of how we can embed a counter fraud culture within the organisation or continue to embed that culture. Um, as we move through the report, we also um, summarise for you uh, the internal audit planned proactive fraud work. So this is where we look at the, uh, the quality, the presence, the robustness of counter fraud controls across the organisation, uh, both the combined authority and Mersey travel. So um, the results of that work will come to you through the internal audit update. Uh, and we've already reported a number of these um, to you and they've been uh, generally positive uh, so far. Um, and we also uh, report at section five on the uh, reactive fraud work. So obviously, if we are to uh, receive any uh, referrals, any um, allegations of fraud, bribery or corruption, those um, come uh, to me. It's a requirement of the fraud, bribery and corruption policy that any um, of those um, issues are reported to me um, and that we, in, in conjunction with all the parts of the organisation, uh, consider how those issues are, are best investigated. Um, I haven't received any uh, such referrals uh, in the year to date, uh, so there is little to report there. Um, but then section six talks more around uh, the anti-fraud culture and how we go about embedding that. So it talks around uh, the fraud risks, uh, what they look like, um, how we engage with fraud groups across the city region and more widely, um, how we undergo training and awareness around fraud uh, for staff, um, and how we uh, establish a policy framework uh, which sets out for, for staff um, and for, um, in some instances, certainly in terms of the, the whistleblowing policy, sets out for public confidence as well, um, how we address and respond to um, significant issues um, or, or whistleblows or, or allegations. Um, so one of the parts of this report is that each of those um, six policies have been uh, refreshed. We've made a few minor changes to them. There's nothing too significant, um, but those are presented to you for your um, for your review and uh, approval. Um, and, and those are attached. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Laura. Are there, are there any questions? Haven't had any indications, Council Chair. I seem to have disappeared off there. I don't understand why. Just hang on a second. Does that make a difference? Yes, it does. <laughs> okay, so so there there are, there are no questions. Um, I I kind of had one that needs to do with I think section six point three. Um, Laura. And it states that 22% of employees um, took training. So that, that seems like quite a low figure to me, um, considering this is quite an important issue. So is there anything that can be done to boost uh, the uptake of training at all? Thank you, Chair. Yes, absolutely. It is disappointing that, that the take up of the fraud awareness uh, e-learning has been so low. Um, and it is um, a matter of, of constant attention for us. Um, so in issuing the counter fraud policies on an annual basis, we issue those through some policy software, which enables us to, to monitor take up levels. Um, and in, in monitoring those take up levels, we've also um, been doing some quite intensive work with heads of service uh, to encourage and to highlight to heads of service um, which members of staff haven't undertaken the training so that they can take appropriate action. Um, I think it's also worthwhile saying that um, I have had some engagement with the learning team around um, training more widely and we are working on, and I'm part of, of the group uh, to, to do this, working on establishing a more, um, a stronger basis for take up of mandatory training, which counter fraud training um, forms part of that. Um, and so I would hope that going forward, the organisation would have a much clearer view um, on what types of training are mandatory for all staff to complete. Uh, and then that would give the organisation a clear review in terms of chasing up, take up and, and, and making our jobs easier um, in terms of ensuring that uh, that, that uh, training is completed. 
it is something that we're really keen on and we think it you know it is a, a short awareness course um, which all staff would, would benefit from um, so we continue to, to chase that up um, and I will bring back to you um, at subsequent meetings an update in terms of where we are with that take up and, and how that percentage hopefully increases over time. Thanks Laura that's great um, and it's good to know that, you know that these are, are to keep these the policies as well coming back to the, um, this committee um, it keeps the profile high um, not not just with us you know as people who are, who are overseeing overviewing this but you know also within the departments within the authority itself as well yes yeah, so that's great so if there are, are there any more questions no then can we agree the recommendations are set out on page 35 that report please agreed 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 Brilliant, thank you. So, uh, last agenda item, the risk management update. Can I invite Laura Williams, Head of Risk Man Management, um, Head of Internal Audit, to present the risk management update. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, again, this is the routine uh, internal um, risk management update that comes to each one of these meetings uh, for your um, information. Um, so, the, the significant uh, things to, to pick out from this report um, is firstly the, the ongoing review of the corporate risk register and that risk register is attached to the report for your uh, information. Uh, in the, the period there have been a couple of changes made uh, to that corporate risk register um, as a, a function of the updating process that has taken place. Um, so first of all the, the, the template for the risk register has actually um, evolved and you'll see um, that we've added uh, some of the things that, that came through uh, the risk management policy which the committee approved back at the September uh, 2020 meeting um, and so we are um, it's the subject of ongoing work to, to fill in those additional um, blanks, as it were, with directors um, to, to get the, um, the templates uh, completed. Um, but there are a couple of, of changes, as I say. One is that we've merged uh, two of the, the, the risks that were on there that were rather um, similar around financial sustainability. So we've merged those into one and we're now left with um, risk number two, uh, which we've reworded to incorporate both of those risks and risk 11 has been removed. Um, and we've also updated uh, risk 13, which is around transport operator liquidity. Um, and this is really to take on board the, the wider issues around transport funding um, model um, and obviously is linked very much to, to changes in travel behaviour as a, a function of the pandemic. Um, and obviously the, the ongoing uncertainty in terms of how long those changes will last and, and how the recovery will look um, in terms of, of those and how operators will be um, affected by that. So that remains a significant risk um, to, to the organisation. Section three sets out the developments that have been made in respect of the service risk registers um, and again ongoing work with heads of service uh, to continue to develop those risks um, to ensure that we, we've got the right risks reflected there um, around for example heightened fraud risks, cyber attack risks um, arising from the pandemic as a couple of examples but clearly there will be others uh, that are specific things that, that threaten the delivery of um, services within the business and obviously we can see those uh, now being reflected um, within those service risk registers which is really positive to see. Um, and then we go on in section four just to, to outline uh, the, the ongoing work to embed effective risk management across the organisation and I'm really pleased to say that I think the, the, the process um, and the progress that has been made uh, in respect of this um, in recent months has been extremely positive. Um, we're very fortunate that we have been able to recruit a risk manager um, who's been able to um, dedicate uh, her time and effort to, to making a lot of this happen and facilitating this process and um, which has been really really positive but but also it wouldn't happen without the directors and heads of service really engaging with the process and, and we really are seeing that uh, really um, taking off particularly in respect of major projects um, and it's very positive to see that we are routinely being consulted now and involved in those projects um, as they are getting off the ground and, and developing so that's, that's really heartening progress to, to be able to reflect to you. 
Um, we're not immune from being audited, uh, so at section uh, 4.3, um, I set out for you the ongoing progress uh, in respect of the recommendations uh, from the last audit, uh, and members will note that there's just a couple of recommendations that we're just finishing off uh, the implementation of, uh, which is uh, positive. Um, and then, as I say, the, the report concludes by giving you the updated risk register um, in the appendix uh, for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions on that report. Thank you. Hang on. Thank you, Laura. Um, any questions? Members? Councillor Cameron has indicated she'd like to ask a question, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Cameron, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Laura. Obviously, you mentioned mentioned the transport provider liquidity, and I think you know that's it's certainly complex and it's certainly strange times are in. But on your red, amber, green, and the progress you're making, where the date is December 20, and the uh, and the green is given in the end column, um, how does that indicate that it's going to be an ongoing problem? It it looks it looks a little bit like. Um, it, it's resolved in some way with a red, amber, green. So I'm not sure how we can look at um, when we feel we may be in a much better position to be able to understand fully um, liquidity around these big issues. OK, thank you, Councillor Cameron. Um, so that end column um, is really around progress in respect of the actions that have been outlined. Uh, but the really important column for you to look at is the residual risk score. So that's further over to the left, sort of more in the, the centre of the document. Um, so that um, highlights the fact that we still have an outstanding uh, risk there of a significant uh, score. So I think we're still scoring. Let me just find it. Excuse me for a moment. Um, so we're still scoring 20 there, aren't we? Right. Yeah, uh, so so well, obviously our yeah, maximum thanks. score is... I can see that, thanks. It's probably more about the date uh, where it says December 20 and then the actions completed. All the other columns say ongoing. So, so the actions that you'd set out were completed by December 20 and that that then it gets the green score and obviously I understand all the other it's going to always be an ongoing thing but it's probably more that it didn't say timescale ongoing it just said December 20 so I presume as it's going to be an iterative process there'll be another date whereby the next set of um, actions that you feel you know may be necessary could be completed by. Yes, I mean, there aren't always additional actions because sometimes we, we will be in a position where we say as an organisation, actually, we've, we've done as much as we can do here. Um, and now this, you know, there are wider issues at play here. So not every um, risk will actually have a set of actions against it all the time. And just because you've completed all the actions doesn't actually mean that the risk has gone away. It simply means that you may have exhausted um, as much as you have latitude to do as an organisation. And I think that's the position that we're starting to find ourselves in with, with this risk, that actually we, we've mitigated and, and controlled the risk um, to quite a, a, a good level. But actually, the risks that exist as a result of COVID, we can only mitigate to a certain level. Um, and actually, the residual risk score, which is what we're left with, the residuum of risk, um, is still high. Um, so whilst we are in a position where we're saying, well, yes, we've completed um, the actions that we think are pertinent for us, and, and I'm sure that there will be further actions when we re revisit this risk again, um, but we're still left with a, a, a residuum of risk that is still that is still high, which is effectively the, the element of the risk that is, is outside of our control. If that yeah. hopefully makes sense. No, I appreciate there's lots of external issues that you couldn't possibly uh, mitigate and liquidity we know, will always be difficult. And so just to clarify, is that mainly centering around Mersey Rail and the the um, operator, uh, you know, of last resort, if you like, or or does that include all of the plans for the whole integrated travel system that that that's um, been uh, obviously uh, a challenge and, and a target that we've been we've been trying to drive towards for a long time now? 
Yes, I mean, I think it it, it did originate as, as very much a rail risk, but I think as the pandemic has gone on, obviously we've had the various lockdowns and, and all of the implications associated with that. Um, I think we're, we're cognizant as an organisation of, of the wider risks around this. So, um, so certainly if a bus operator was to go under as a result of some of the, um, the issues around patronage, that whilst we don't have a specific um, duty in law to be operator of last resort, we will be left with a big problem that we would need clearly to take uh, action to address. So I think it's more nuanced with some of the other parts of the transport network. It's very obvious in terms of rail, and as I say, that's where it's um, originated. But I think um, there is an understanding that, that not only, um, you know, that, that bus operators could quite easily find themselves in a similar situation. And as I say, we, we, we could be left holding the baby um, again uh, there uh, in a, a, a more subtle uh, way. But I think that the other thing that we tried to reflect um, within uh, some of the narrative around this uh, report is around the, the funding model as well and, and how that moves and, and changes going forward. Um, clearly, some of the um, arrangements around operator of last resort are not really defi defined or designed to, to address a situation like a pandemic that they're, they're more for, um, you know, if the rail operator wanted to walk away because of wider um, profitability concerns so um, or capacity concerns. So there's a little bit about sort of trying to, to look at the, the responsibilities that the CA has um, in light of, of the pandemic, which is a little bit like comparing apples and pears, really. Um, but yes, it, it, we are trying to sort of broaden this out to give a flavour for the, the overall overarching um, responsibilities that we have uh, to provide the transport system and, and how we rely heavily on our operators to do that. And clearly, if they are not there, not able to provide that service, then, you know, that the book stops with us, as it were. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. So I see your question, um, Councillor Cameron. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Chair, we've received a question from Martin McDonough, our independent member. He's having some difficulty accessing the meeting, but he's asked, um, how has the COVID pandemic and flooding affected the business plan as it is unlikely that patronage and revenue will return to pre-COVID levels for many years? I actually myself, I did have a question surrounding um, CA6 on the, uh, the the risk report, um, you know, um, regarding now that we've left the, the EU, what 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 would be, you know, the impact on, on that? So perhaps Laura could combine those questions together. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so if we take the point around um, around Brexit first, I think very much now there needs to be um, an organisational review of that risk um, because it very much came from the time prior to uh, the deal being um, being struck at the end of December uh, with, with the European Union. And so there were still um, great uncertainties, as I think still exist to some extent, um, to, to around what that would actually mean for us. So I think that is the body of work that now will, will need to be uh, picked up and, and I'm sure it is being picked up but needs to be reflected uh, within the risk register. Um, in terms of um, the impact of the um, pandemic on the business plan, I think um, the business plan is very much um, around building back better. You know, this is one of the absolutely key themes. Um, so it's very much about looking at how uh, the organisation can support the recovery within the city region. And that comes through very much um, as a, a very strong theme. So I think, the, you know, the pandemic and the, the, the economic um, and social implications of it come through loud and clear within that document. Um, and I think that, that very much in terms of, of the planning around provision of transport services um, in line with changes in public behaviour um, and, and public attitudes towards public transport and indeed some of the government messaging, which has been very much around keep off public transport, keep away from it, um, which hasn't always been too, too helpful to our cause. Um, but but certainly that is something that um, is being looked at on a number of levels um, and there is some modelling work that's being done to try to make sense of what this will mean uh, in the future. Um, so again, that is very much work in progress. I think um, the presence of um, and the development of, of vaccines and treatments for um, 
for COVID will hopefully increase public confidence to, to get back out onto public transport. But also we need to remember that um, as a transport authority, we also have an agenda around active travel. Um, and we also want to use some of those changes in behaviour to encourage some of that as well. Um, so it isn't all about getting people back onto buses and trains. Some of it is about using that, that behaviour change in a positive way. Clearly on a day like today, going for a walk might not be too attractive to people, but as we move hopefully out of the pandemic into some better weather, we can hopefully try to influence some behaviours um, and, and create some um, cycle routes, walking routes, etc, et, et which uh, members will already um, be aware of some schemes within the local areas um, along those lines. OK, thank you, Laura. Um, are there any other questions? Is there um, a way that we can um, let Mr McDonald know the, the answers to the questions that he's raised, considering he couldn't access the meeting? Yes, I'll write to him after the meeting and let him know. Thank you. So if there are no more questions, uh, can we agree the recommendations set out on page 119 of the report, please? Agreed. Thank you. Um, can I now declare the meeting closed and thank everybody for their attendance. The next meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee will be on the 3rd of March 2021 at 2 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Shauna, can I just ask you to stay behind for a second?